Welcome back to Turning Hard Times to Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor, and I'm really happy to have with me once again Axel Merck. He's the President and Chief Investment Officer of Merck Investments and the management, uh, Manager of the Merck Funds. Thank you, Axel, for joining me again from sunny Florida today, I understand. Yes, for a few hours anyway. For a few more hours, and you were there attending... Are, you're there now, currently attending the ETF conference in Florida, and I, I've noticed uh, Bob Pisani on CNBC reporting and, and interviewing a few people from down there. But I, you know, before we get started here on some of these topics of, of the Swiss National Bank and what's going on in Euro and the Euro, uh, to the Euro, to the dollar, to gold, and so forth, uh, I'd, I'd like you just to mention again O U N Z your uh, your ETF that allows you to not only buy gold uh, electronically, but you can actually take delivery of it. How is that going? Oh, it's, it's going quite nicely. I mean, we, it's an ETF like the other gold ETFs. We have physical London bars in London, but investors can take delivery of the gold. And in fact, uh, just last week, we completed another delivery. Somebody took 40 ounces, um, had it delivered to their home. We can convert it into coins. In this case, it was Kurt Mint's one-ounce bars. And uh, uh-huh. what's nice about it is that taking delivery in itself is not a taxable event. And so when you have appreciated gold, so to speak, um, with the other ETFs, if you want to have a coin, you'd have to sell it, potentially pay taxes, and then you can buy the coin. Whereas with pounds, um, you can just take the little what you already own and you retain your original cost basis. Other than that, it trades like an ETF, um, has had a very nice one cent spread in the market, and uh, it, uh, it's a way to buy gold. And uh, obviously, some people prefer the physical ones, and here you kind of get the best of both worlds, at least that's what we think. Yeah, you have the option at least of taking it. I, I, I believe that you are the only ETF that does that. Yes, we have a patent on the process. Nobody before us was able to break the barrier between the institutional and the retail world. As, as you well know, those two sides don't really talk to each other. It took us quite a few years to, um, to, to create that interface, um, but it's working smoothly. And uh, it's, it's not that everybody's going to take delivery, but people appreciate that they can take delivery. Well, and you have the option, too. That's good, and it's good to know that uh, so far everybody's been able to take delivery that has requested it. So, uh, and you, can, you can always take delivery of the London boss. It's just most folks don't like London boss, and so then we convert it into coins, but uh, anybody has, has the right to, and uh, yeah. Well, we have a lot of people that are skeptical about the ability to take delivery, so I think uh, uh, that's important to know that it uh, that, is, that has come off without a hitch. Uh, switching gears a little bit, uh, I, I sort of I listened in. We listen, my wife and I, frequently to uh, Bloomberg Radio here in New York, and uh, I enjoy uh, hearing people I know, especially like yourself. You were with Ka- Kathleen Hayes on Bloomberg, I think it, probably around the start of the year, and at that point you were quite... As I recall, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you were quite bullish on the euro. You were quite bullish on gold going forward, and not so bullish, I think, maybe bearish on the dollar. Now, so far, and the year is very, very young, of course, uh, and, and I suspect that you'll be right before the year is over, but have uh, a lot of things have changed uh, since then, perhaps. I mean, the SNB comes out and depegs uh, for, uh, it's, uh, the Swiss franc from the euro. Uh, we've had, of course, the elections in Greece. Uh, are, are you still seeing things the same way, Mer- Axel? Well, I get a lot of phone calls when somebody wants to get a positive call on the euro because we've had more positive than others are. It doesn't mean we're never short on the euro. We have an absolute return strategy. We have been shorting quite a bit the euro. But let me let me tell you the context in which I made those comments. Um, what I've been arguing, and uh, today I think in the market is proof of that, is that the dollar has been rising on the backdrop of a rising stock market. The dollar has been rising in a quote-unquote risk-on environment, which mm-hmm. conversely to me means that if there's ever again a drop in the S&P, maybe the quote-unquote flight to quality isn't the U.S. dollar, but instead is out of the dollar. And we see that in a day like today when we're talking, when, when the S&P is down rather sharply and the dollar is down across all major currencies. Mm-hmm. And so that's and that's why I like to mention the euro because people pay attention when I say something positive about the euro. But then they like today the euro is up quite a bit. Now, obviously, what we have today, one of the reasons the euro is up today is nobody wanted to be long the euro um, at the end of last week ahead of the Greek elections, and there's some short covering and but sure. Not, but the, the the fact of the matter is that the the, the the euro has been beaten down, and if you put it in the context of of QE uh, with the Fed as well, the dollar weakened on the announcement of QE when it actually started to be implemented. It didn't weaken anymore. Now, I, I cannot give any guarantees that he was going to weaken it. By all means, Draghi is convinced that he's going to be able to weaken it, so it's difficult to fight him. But sometimes when everybody has an opinion, you've got to be a little bit careful embracing that. 
Yeah, it's sometimes it's, it's uh, when everybody thinks alike, nobody's thinking, somebody said. And then uh, maybe that's an opportunity for those who might think and care to question the premise that everybody's operating under. Are we surprised at all by the size of Draghi's announcement the other day? Well, it was meant to surprise. Um, the, uh, and, and the day before, there were leaks that gave the size of the program. And uh, the day before, they said they'd buy 50 billion euros a month. That leak pushed the euro down for about three minutes, um, and so the next day he said 60 billion. Um, the point, though, is that nobody, including Draghi, knows what impact this has. And the reason mm-hmm. nobody knows is it's very different from the Fed or the Bank of Japan. When the central banks, they are buy government bonds, the, the sellers can turn around and deposit the cash with the central bank. You can't easily do that with negative interest rates at the ECB. And so you're comparing apples to oranges. And so it's, it's really completely irrelevant what he says. The only thing he says, he's not going to stop until inflation expectations are picking upward again. That's really the reference point. And the question mm-hmm. really is, does printing money in this case increase those inflationary expectations? How can you get inflation into an economy when um, banks are not lending, when, um, when you have sanctions against Russia, when you cannot start a business because of bureaucracies and so forth. Those are the real the impediments to growth and the impediments to, to getting inflation up. Um, and so he's going to try to do what he can do with the printing press. Uh, he's going to cause some damage. I'm not so convinced, though, that it is the currency he's going to weaken the most. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you're not. Yeah, you're not. You're not so. Uh, run that one by me again. You're not. Con- you're not convinced the currency is going to weaken the most. Well, uh, meaning that he's already gotten the euro down from the high one one thirties um, at, at, at last summer um, down to uh, one ten. It was the low point. Sure. Now. And that's sure. that's quite a drop. Uh, and and so of course the 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 the, the, the going starter is while well, everything is going to fall in part in Europe. And while I'm, I'm, it's always difficult for me to vent the euro because I, I'm not that positive on it, but if you look at Greece, for example, um, in 2011, it was Southern European financial institutions, Spanish, French financial institutions holding Greek debt. Nowadays, it's the IMF, it's the European Central Bank, it's hedge funds holding Greek debt. Who cares if they default on their debt? Well, the ones <laughs> who care are the Greek people, but there is uh-huh. not going to be the so-called contagion. And, and then it, it again comes out that Greece is a small economy. Now, what matters and what is relevant is that um, the anti-austerity movement is, is making the rounds in Europe and in Spain that's surging in popularity. So those sort of things do matter. Um, but other than that, we could care less what the Greeks are up to. It is a mess. It has always been a mess, although actually they have made a huge progress, at least until now. They've reached the, uh, reached the primary surplus. Now, that may go out of the window with the... The, the new communists there in power, but um, but um, I am not convinced that Greece is going to dictate what the euro is going to be up to next. Do what? Do you think uh, there could be a contagion effect here? With uh, you know, let's take the easy way out in life. I mean, that's always appealing to people. Uh, and then, of course, the qu- the question is, how are the Germans and and others going to react to that? Well, let's let's differentiate between what people say and what they do. Everybody's always going to talk according to their own constituents. So the Germans are going to play tough because Merkel wants to get reelected. Well, maybe Merkel has done now enough, but her party wants to be reelected. And so mm-hmm. similarly, the new government in Greece is going to talk like they're going to change everything. In the end, some muddle through solution is the most likely outcome. Now, bear in mind, with all this talk, the talk about the year, we talked about gold earlier. By all means, gold is the biggest position in our hot currency stand these days. I do think that all the countries are debasing their currencies. And, and, and so I, I just think that the euro is not going to be quite as bad off as some people think, and people might get very much surprised that if the currency was beaten down that much, it's going, to, it's going to do much better going forward. The Norwegian crown is a story like that as well. The Norwegian crown will be the worst performing la- major currency last year. Um, things are bad in Norway, but, hey, they can bounce back from, from quite deep. And then at the end of the spectrum, let's look at the Fed, um, this so-called exit, well, we're going to have negative real interest rates, even with some of the most hawkish predictions that we have about where the Fed is going to be. And and, and so uh, we think that everything is so great in the U.S., everything is so horrible in the rest of the world. The world, in practice, is in tones of gray, and so we're looking where there's value. And then on the scheme of things, there's probably more value in the euro than the dollar right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, were you surprised by the uh, SNB's action, their their sudden decision to to loosen the Swiss franc from the euro? I think everybody was. Now, put in context here, in, in 2011, when they introduced that ceiling, we were very harsh critics of that. And uh, we think it's a bad policy because it, 
it encouraged people to be complacent. Um, but to remove the PEC at this stage didn't make any sense from the Swiss point of view. One of the things we try to do in our work is put ourselves into the shoes of the policymakers. And what would you do if you were them? And it just didn't make any sense from their point of view. They were successful defending the PEG. They had lowered rates to negative territory at the end of last year. So that alleviated the pressure. And they could have done much more in that direction. And you don't get out of that policy then unless you really have a reason. Now, you may not want to wait until the breaking point, but you want to see that there's a problem with this policy. And the only quote-unquote problem they had is that Draghi is saying he's going to print a boatload of money, um, which to me suggests that Jordan, the head of the Swiss National Bank, was never really fully on board with the policy in the first place. Uh -huh. um, then he shouldn't have become the head of the Swiss National Bank and implement the policy. Now, um, now they've created this huge mess. Um, you should have seen him give his press conferences. It's like a schoolboy um, stuttering when he gives answers. Um, and, and just uh, today, the Swiss National Bank came out and says they might have to um, print an irrational amount of money to, to try to um, weaken the Swiss franc again. I mean, they have damaged themselves. They have damaged central banking in general. Uh, but also, and before we kind of make this too much of a Swiss problem, I think the relevance of this is that this is a sign that central banks have masked risk in general. Risky assets don't appear risky anymore. Shorting the Swiss franc didn't appear risky. We have the same issues in the stock and bond markets. Risk can blow up on our faces anywhere. Um, volatility is down in the stock market in general, and that can come back. That requires a repricing of asset prices, and that is really the, the, the canary in the coal mine here, that maybe we're not going to see a 40% move in currencies um, as a more common thing, but we're going to see things blow up in somewhere, and it's going to be a different place, and people are not going to be prepared for it. You know, Axel, today the uh, the equity market in the U.S. is down pretty sharply, as you noted, and one of the main reasons that I'm hearing given for it is a shortage, you know, a, a shortfall in the earnings, uh, to a great extent tied to the stronger dollar. So surprise. If, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, uh, the but yeah, why are people surprised by that uh, is a good question. But the point is that this is showing the real pain with a sort of strong dollar, strong I don't strong dollar in quotes because the dollar is, uh, as you say, I think it seems to me that what's happening is all of the in a coordinated effort. These major central banks are working one after another. For example, when we stopped QE here, Japan jumped in with a huge dose of. Uh, illegitimate money, in my view. Uh, and then, of course, now we have uh, the Europeans doing the same thing. Uh, but do you think, I mean, it seems to me, it's hard for me to believe, and I've never really believed, I think you're in the same camp, I'm not sure, but I want to ask you, do you really think that we can go through uh, with, or do you, do you see how we can possibly continue, uh, or how we can avoid QE5 or QE Infinite going forward? Well, just take a step back before we get too technical. What are the interests of the different stakeholders? What's the interest of the government? What's the interest of the citizens? And what's the interest of foreigners? If you, uh, if you take the U.S., the government has too much debt. Consumers have too much debt. And the foreigners are holding that debt. So as a government, you have an incentive to inflate the problem away, and you're not going to face any resistance. It's you, somebody who has had some savings, who is going to be losing out. Um, and that's really the problem we have. The foreigners are not voting. And so we, the governments have an incentive to debase the value of the debt. Now, clearly, that's not necessarily going to help you become more prosperous. No country ever has been able to um, depreciate itself into prosperity. But that is the course that we are on. And, and, and so um, and, and we have to deal with that. The, when the incentives of a government are not aligned with that of its citizens, and I'm not just being with a U.S. government. It's the same in the Eurozone. It's the same in Japan. Um, and in many other places in the world, then um, we live in an environment of financial repression, which means we have negative real interest rates. And the question is, what do you do about it? You have currency risk. Holding cash in your local currency in dollars is risky because you're losing purchasing power. And that is why people do all these crazy things. Well, that, that, makes, that makes perfect sense. We're trying to force some of the pain on the foreign creditors. And clearly, um, you know, countries, uh, most notably Japan, uh, China, 
is not at all interested, and they are, from all I read and uh, and hear, trying to divest themselves of dollars as much and as rapidly as they can without causing the whole house of cards to fall down. Yeah, and this uh, has that problem, by the way, now. The Swiss now hold all these, these, these euro bonds. They hold some American treasures as well, and then now they have to sell them at a loss. And so it's not so easy to sell that stuff because then you have a political problem at home. I don't think the head of the Swiss National Bank is going to have his job in a year from now um, because there are going to be lots of parliamentary hearings about the the losses he's calling to the Swiss economy. What uh, I believe that you were very much in favor of the uh, the referendum for a return to some sort of gold backing of the Swiss uh, franc. Uh, should have he done that? Should have should have the Swiss National Bank have been supportive of that instead of uh, going out of their way to try to keep it from happening? Well, people always like to have power. This would have restricted the power of the central bank, and so of course right. they were against it. Now, the very point of the policy was to restrict the power because they were pursuing irrational or irresponsible policies. And uh, some people may wonder why, on the one hand, I think that they shouldn't have removed this peg at this moment. It's always kind of, you, you take, it depends on the vantage point that you're coming from. As a saver, yes, you want to have purchasing power, um, but as the, the Swiss National Bank, they had, they were on a different course. Now, there were some, some flaws in how this referendum was designed. The reason I loved it is mostly as a talking point because it, it, it brings to it, it brings out the, the right discussions to talk about well what's the purpose of a central bank and mm-hmm. I think um, most most on your program and would agree that central banks have failed quite quite dramatically in many of the things that they have done um, throughout the world and, and the, the thing I am most concerned about is that on the one hand um, they are destroying the purchasing power of people worldwide but beyond that they're destroying the social fabric of countries around the world um, because the and more and more people are falling through the cracks that, that, that can't make ends meet with the erosion of purchasing power that's created um, in the system. And then a few people who know how to deal with credit very well are doing very well. And the response by policymakers is, well, let's tax the wealthy. Uh, and yeah. instead, we should have prudent policies, a good a short-term policy, a good long-term policy. If we went back to that, maybe, maybe we, we, we'd all be much better off. Well, I have no doubt about that. It, it, destroying the purchasing power also, I would argue, destroying uh, the price discovery of capital. And to me, that's just the surefire way of destroying capitalism, which provides wealth for people. Socialism encourages the destruction and the consumption of wealth, and capitalism encourages the, uh, uh, the formation of capital, the growth, development of uh, human society. So I think you're, you're absolutely right about all that, Axel. So uh, we just have uh, less than a minute left here yet. The bottom line, then, is what? We, we see central banks with printing money. They cannot stop. Is that right? And that, then, should mean that people should go to an asset-backed currency. They will try to stop occasionally. The Fed is trying an exit periodically. I don't think they can get to an exit. They may start raising nominal rates, but we will have negative real interest rates even if they, they get try to get out of this before they have to reverse course. Um, it means that we're going to get much more volatility in the markets because we encourage leverage. Then risk premium rises as as central banks try to exit, and that can cause huge problems. If we're lucky, we'll muddle through. If we're unlucky, much worse things can happen. Well, we'll have to leave it at that for now. Thank you very much, Axel, for being with us again, and uh, really look forward to talking to you again sometime soon. Thank you so much. My pleasure. 